Alright, we have a few more this week uh, as we head into our somewhat uneventful summer. Um, but we've got a couple of interesting things here, starting with uh, Upgrade. The one that um, that other section of Blumhouse did, uh, their tilt section or whatever, that's... Um, They've now brought in um, this movie that Leonel wrote and directed that I really hadn't heard much about at all, except like a couple of like still ads on a couple of websites, uh, just with Logan Marshall Green's face, and that's all I really knew. And then I started hearing about this. It was getting comparisons to like being like a really gritty, violent, R-rated version of Iron Man. <laughs> um, so it's like if it's Iron Man if Jarvis was like really uncontrollably violent. Um, so I went in knowing just that pretty much, and yeah, and it's really it has a nice start off with these um, kind of awesomely inspired opening titles, if you can call them opening titles. Um, and that's it's one of those cases where I almost was like, I didn't really have any expectations because I didn't know what it was. But just something about it in, like, its first few seconds, I just had a really good feeling this was going to be something. Even though I believe Lee Wano has not directed a movie himself since Insidious 3, um, which was a bit, you know, uninspired and seemed to mostly be him kind of channeling James Wan. So, I, but still, I just had a really good feeling about this one, and I'm really glad that that paid off. Um, so, it's... I, I'm assuming most people know by now what it is, but where it's set in this, um, I guess, futuristic world. I don't, I don't think they ever gave us a specific time, but basically there's, like, self-driving cars, and the cars, like, have, you know, voice command to the point that it's basically like having another person there, more or less. Um, and that's what most of the technology seems to have become. Um, but, of course, we're going to have our protagonist, who is Logan Marshall Green, who you might remember from Prometheus or The Invitation. Of course, to contrast, um, he is much more about more manual things, like more classic cars and things that don't monitor everything, um, like everything here does. And there's also um, the point in time when he's talking about how he doesn't really go for everything being futuristic because all he sees is unemployment lines. So he, there's obviously going to be this contrast, but ultimately this might ultimately help pay off for him in a really big way. Good or bad uh, is what we find out. So what I really like about this is how well, despite the fact that it is like this really violent, blood-drenched movie um, with a lot of like snapped bones and stuff in it, it's actually a story that's really told with care when we're going into it at the start, because it's, it's only about 95 minutes, so you would think it kind of has to hurry itself along to get to all the points it needs to do, but really it helps that the plot is so simple because overall, despite its, you know, kind of elaborate setup um, from a technical standpoint, but it's able to get... The fact that the plot is so simple overall it really gives it time to, like, build up in this first half hour uh, from a character perspective and where exactly he's coming from with him having to obviously his wife is murdered by this gang of people and then he has to basically gets the idea that he needs to go find them and kill them it kill them it's basically the whole revenge plot just happens to be in a futuristic world but we get like this good first half hour or so of him obviously paralyzed from the waist down after what or the neck down after what they did to him uh, and basically him having to live with this and it's like really tragic and they play it up like they would any kind of movie where the protagonist is a paraplegic um, just all the same kind of drama beats but they feel but they're really well done and you can obviously we know they're being used to kind of kind of lay the ground before it takes off in the direction we know it's going uh, and as that it really works well and that actually also works later when, um, like, he has uh, some tender scenes with his mom uh, shortly after, you know, some of the killings have happened. And you would think that would make it kind of tonally off, but the, it actually really works considering that because we had that opening and the first few scenes like that, that that kind of feels like our starting point. Um, so it doesn't feel like it... It's like... It, it's not like... It seems out of place to say, oh, after all, you know, the bone crunching and the blood and the slicing and all that, and the partial decapitations and all that, um, 
that it seems out of place to go back to being like you know kind of more dramatic and more kind of grounded in emotion but it's it's more like we're just going back to what it is because we gradually got there from the start uh starting in territory like that then going into the violence so when we go back to it it doesn't feel out of place or tonally off um which is really well handled because even even with that setup that still could have happened um but he handled it very well and uh yeah i was talking about when he made insidious 3 it did feel like he was Basically, and to his credit, maybe that was to keep that series keep that series kind of in the same tone and the same line. He basically had to emulate Juan. Um, but this one does feel like a unique vision, even if, you know, it's maybe a futuristic world we've kind of seen before with some elements we've seen before. It still very much feels like um, its own kind of self-contained movie, which is great. Um, and, there, I mean, there are moments in there that, um, like... The scene when he does the flipping and the camera kind of follows him, um, it was, Juan's done that a few times in some movies, and then there's the, um, there's the, the actual call out to him where it's, um, when he's in, like, an apartment building and you see all the different names. There's only, like, two names on there because the building's so abandoned, and one of them is J. Juan. And it's like, you can see it clear as day. <laughs> um, which is, which is still really nice, though, so, uh, that's great. And then there is, um, also the way they really build up um, so, like, some of these sets I was talking about, like, they do kind of do the futuristic thing a little bit. There's also, uh, there was a, there was a similar setting in Bright, uh, but I like this movie better, so I'm probably just gonna, <laughs> so the praise might seem a little more sincere. Um, the bar, um, where it's like, there's like a bones kind of decorated is a really kind of cool gritty look for this particular setting that's supposed to be like off the grid and really seedy and all that so um oh, oh, the settings really work too whether it's stuff like that or whether it's the more futuristic look um it just all really works and one thing that really completely threw me off in a good way that i was not expecting um is that this is one of those movies that is surprisingly funny as hell <laughs> <laughs> and I, I I think the people that were in the theater with me, all like five of them, I don't think really were expecting that either either because it's like like the first scene when Stem takes over and he has to fight somebody off. Um, and it's not the kind of thing you would expect where it's like it's like, oh suddenly, you know, the guy can do this now, he's just some hardcore badass. But no, it's because Stem is working his body for him, he's still here and conscious and witnessing this as a scared human being <laughs> as it's happening. It's very Evil Dead too, um, but once again, still kind of feels like its own thing too. And everybody seems to be watching this in the theater perfectly straight, and thank thank God I laugh like quietly. Like, I don't make a lot of noise when I laugh because I was laughing my ass off during this scene. Um, and, it, and that really works well with just how hardcore the violence is, as it's always kind of, the scene's kind of split up where it's also as funny as it is violent and brutal, so I thought that that was really well balanced, and I honestly still cannot believe how much of this movie I spent laughing, which was <laughs> quite a bit, um, especially with such the serious setup they had. Once again, these things don't clash either, they're spread out just enough. It is... When it gets towards the end, um, the way he reacts to things does kind of seem like it's getting a little played out or a little too exaggerated. Um, but even so, um, it, it does work for the most part and is, um, even, even when he's just, when he first realizes that Stem can talk to him, just that initial communication is also very funny too. Um, and Logan Marshall Green really kind of sells this stuff. Like he's... I wasn't quite sure how he was going to do as, like, the singular protagonist, like, lead of a movie. Um, but he's he's really great in this and really balances the the tragedy of the character and the really funny side of the character and is able to kind of have that reluctantly badass way about him when he's actually... The, like, the way he has to move almost robotically um, is stuff that he does really well, too, the physicality of it. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what to expect from him because I pretty much only knew him from, like you know, a side character in Prometheus or in The Invitation, which I wasn't crazy about. Um, but, God, he really nailed this. And um, that's... So I, I'd really like to see him uh, kind of lead more movies now to see what else he can kind of do now that we know that he can do something like this really well. So, And it's also, as you watch it, it's like, this is kind of... You can kind of get a sense of this is what Lucy was trying to do, or at least somewhat to that extent. Um, but this is so much more successful on all grounds and definitely 
kind of the science of it still is kind of like very science fictiony, but they still kind of just make everything like, yeah, I buy that. I'll go ahead and run with that. Sure. Um, and so, and that really just makes the whole thing just very entertaining, no, no matter what, you know, genre it is in the moment. Um, they all kind of mesh together really nicely. So this was just a really huge surprise that I'm really happy with. I, like I said, I had a good feeling about it going in, but, um, yeah, this is pretty much exactly what I was hoping it would be when I heard just little vague things going into it. So yeah. And the, and really the best thing of all is that we have so many movies lately to where I feel like I say so many times a movie's trying to be cool or trying to be badass or something like that. Um, this movie is fucking awesome and feels so effortlessly, like it's effortlessly doing it. Um, and that's that goes a long way, especially, when, like I said, when you have so many movies that attempt to be as cool as something like this, but you can just tell how hard they're trying and it just fails miserably. This just coast so smoothly and even you know we even get a nice kind of car chase climax here which is great we got the side thing going on with the detective investigating who is betty gabriel who we know is georgina and get out um who also is um really kind of well cast here and handles that well also so yes um so every now and then it might seem like it's going in a bit overkill in regards to its kind of I don't know, a genre bending is kind of a strong term, but something to that extent. But um, for the most part, it really does work. It's very creative. It's very well handled. And uh, yes, I was very much applauding uh, Lee Wan-El mentally on my way out. So uh, yes. So I'd love to see him kind of, because he's, he's pretty much always been associated with James Wan, having written Saw and Insidious and all that. Um, he he might have written Dead Silence too, I think. I can't remember. But um but yeah, if he can like branch out um, with stuff like this and kind of make his own name for himself, um, if he continues down this path, he will totally earn that, hopefully very soon. So uh, yeah, so his collaborations with Blumhouse, like let's, I'd love to see what else that's going to bring. So uh, yes. Uh, the second movie is going to be um, Future World. This is that movie you might have heard about where it's James Franco trying to do Mad Max. Um, he And he has a co-director working with him that I guess is a frequent collaborator. And yeah, this is one of those movies where you just kind of spend the whole thing kind of wondering um, what the what they're even going for. But <laughs> Because here's the thing, is it seems like it's weird and out of nowhere, kind, kind of in a good way, in an intriguing way, because... When you see what Franco has directed up to this point, it's always the the really artsy shit or the, like the um the literary adaptations like As I Lay Dying and The Sound and the Fury and like there's Indubious Battle recently which is they're all not that great. Um and then in the, he and then he kind of really kind of rose out and got onto the uh more into the mainstream when he did The Disaster Artist, a movie that people actually saw, actually liked. Um, that he had directed, and so it seems like such a weird direction that his next thing would be, hey, let's do a Mad Max type movie. Let's do a post-apocalyptic guys on motorcycles movie. Um, it, it's, it's, I don't know, but the thing here is, and he's the villain, I guess. Like, there's a lot of the time you can't really tell who is a villain and who isn't, but he's definitely a villain. I think, um, because he, like, he does, he wears the mask, he does the laughing, he does the tongue flicking and all that, but the thing is, is people tend to criticize Franco for seeming a bit half-assed in some of his performances. Obviously, he gives us great stuff, like 127 Hours and Spring Breakers and The Disaster Artist and stuff like that, but, um, then there's all, Pineapple Express, but there's also a lot of times where it just seems like he just is, just has no care in the world whatsoever, and it's like, it's a, it's really a bad feeling when the first time he's on screen, and you can tell he's supposed to be the villain because he's doing the laughing and the tongue flicking and all that. He's got, like, really fucked up teeth or whatever. But the thing is, is when he's doing these things that you know are the over-the-top villain, you know, traits, um, he just, there's just something so half-hearted about it. And, you, and that, that just kind of immediately says, oh, this is... 
So this is how much he's into it. Um, okay, so it makes you wonder how much the co-director had more to do with the creative angle, if um, if his heart just was not in it this much, or this little, or whatever. Um, and, but another thing that really made the movie stand out, I remember when the poster was released, and number one, everybody was like, what's this Photoshop bullshit? But the other thing everybody noticed was the really weird and bizarre cast list, especially for a movie that was getting like no attention and looks so cheap. Um, we have, and most of these characters are, like, pointless, by the way, as you can probably guess, but there's, like, um, there's Snoop Dogg as the owner of, like, a brothel, who's basically, he gets to basically be a Snoop Dogg type, only in this Mad Max world. Um, there's Method Man as one of the dudes on the motorbikes or whatever. Um, there is, uh, Mia Jovovich is, like, a big drug lord who is just called a drug lord in a war, in a place called, like, Drug Land or something. Um, it's all very, very basic. Um, there's Lucy Liu as, I guess, a queen. Lucy Liu spends her entire screen time in bed, except for the very end when she gets out of bed. That's all, <laughs> and that's it. Uh, she hardly even has to say anything. Just her presence here is very, um, weird. Um, but our main people are, um, there's, I can't remember his first name now. It might be Jeffrey or something. Wahlberg? It's the, I can't, I don't know who exactly his parents are, but he is the nephew of Mark Wahlberg and Donnie Wahlberg. Um, and then we have Suki Waterhouse as a robot um, that Franco has basically programmed to love him and kill everybody else. But then he becomes, Wahlberg gets into possession of her and Wahlberg is looking for them while he's also trying to look for some miracle drug. To get from Mia Jovovich to save Lucy Liu, who is sick and dying. I think that's what the fuck was going on. I not, I'm not totally sure on all that. So, um, and first off, and I say so you are house, um, but you, if you saw The Bad Batch, you would think her casting in this kind of feels really redundant, because it's basically her as just right in the middle of what seems to be the same world. Um, and that in itself just feels like, that immediately kind of sucks some life out of it, because it just, before, you're already making Mad Max comparisons before you even see it, and then the second you lay, lay eyes on it, you think you're watching Mad Max, but then suddenly you see her, and it's like, well now when I'm not watching Mad Max, I'm watching The Bad Batch again, and it just never ever feels like its own thing, not even remotely closely. Um, and you would think, with a vision, if you want to call it that, um, it, it, through a vision like Franco's, you would think, well, okay, if it's going to be like that only through his eyes, I've seen what he's done, it's not great stuff, but it should at least be interesting, and at least in a weird way, to see a Mad Max-type world through this, like, arts, <laughs> like, art school kind of 101 vision or whatever, but, um, no. It's just very bland and feels like it's completely directionless. Like I said, looks really cheap. I don't know what the thing is about, like, with the exception of um, the robot, like, Ash. Alien, I guess. Even though she's a girl, I don't know. Um, she's the only one with a name, I think. Everybody else is, like, Warlord or Drug Lord or... He's the, he's the prince and Lucy Lou's the queen, so they're just called Prince and Queen. Um, I, I think they got so lazy, Method Man's name is actually Tattooed Guy, or something like that, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know what that's supposed to represent, maybe just the vacancy of the world or whatever. I, I don't know, it all just feels, it all just feels so empty in the, in the wrong way. Like, in no way does it feel like they intentionally tried to make some artistic thing out of these really bland, almost nothing details. Um, so that's what that is. Um, and we see it through, like, some of the worst cinematography there is. Uh, like I was talking about with Terminal, where it's like, it's, they just shine lights into the camera, and I think that's supposed to look good or something. Um, but there's actually a point in time, you know that thing when you, like, the cam the sun, like, hits the camera and you see, like, those dots or whatever? Um, that happens to Sugi Waterhouse towards the end. And one of those dots, like, covers her entire head for, like, an entire shot. What good could possibly come out of a shot like that? That is unusable footage, and I think they had no other way but to have this one 
piece in it because otherwise the movie would not fit together because this is all the shit that they had because nobody gave a fuck when they were making this clearly. Um, and like, and there's like weird cases of zoom into. It. It's one of those cases where it looks so cheap. You know how, um, like with cheap cameras or whatever, if you were to zoom in, it would make everything start to look kind of fuzzy and out of focus. Well, yeah, sometimes during scenes, especially action scenes, the camera will just do those zooms, and the footage will look like that. Will look like it's really fuzzy, and it's like the camera was not made to zoom in that far. <laughs> and it'll do it for just a second on, like, one thing, and then just cut back to, like, a wide shot. And I... What, what good is any of this? Like, how can you... <laughs> I, I don't know. But, um... And it's like, okay, if it's doing this... Is it like trying to? Is this its way of trying to find its own identity, or like its own footing, or whatever? Because um, it's just really not working whatsoever. Um, and they even and if you want to talk Mad Max comparisons, also they even basically have the the Thunderdome, or their version of the Thunderdome. They have all the people standing around, and it's two people fighting to the death. There's only one problem. Um, instead of the Thunderdome, it's literally an empty swimming pool. <laughs> This, I don't know, literally, I don't know whose backyard they shot this in, but I'm pretty sure it's somebody's backyard. Um, and for a movie like this, it's supposed to feel, like, really big in scale and all this, and all, like, the wide deserts and all that. Um, yeah, just, just none of that's really coming through. Um, oh, and if, the, if you're into that, another, this is another movie with another pointless girl-on-girl -girl scene for no fucking reason, so have that, if you will. Um, so you watch this, and it's the kind of thing to where you're just like, how did anybody have the passion for this material to get this made? Like, how did this get from the stage it was at the beginning to on this screen with these actors? When it seemed like, like, who could, who could really have a connection to this? Because I feel like the people that made it didn't. And it's, it kind of makes you wonder, like, Maybe it's something that had bigger ideas, but, like, somewhere along the way it, like, had to be whittled down, whether it be, like, you know, budget reasons or whatever, or creative differences or something. Surely there was something greater before they started, because once they started, um, it just feels like, who, who wanted to make this? I, I don't know, but, um, that's, that's basically what it is. And, of course, eventually it's gonna try to get all philosophical, Talking about souls and shit. And the thing is, is it's like, this would be tired dialogue, even if the main characters were interesting. It's just kind of the cherry on top that the characters are just, have no personality whatsoever. And I know she's a robot, but still, there's nothing. Because the thing is, it's like, it kind of starts to feel like Westworld as well. Like the show Westworld, especially when they try to debate stuff like that. And then this is when it gets weird. <laughs> because... You're starting to compare it to the show, Westworld, but the thing is, is that there is the movie, Westworld, the 73 one with Joel Brenner, and you remember that that movie, Westworld, had a sequel, and that movie's sequel was called Future World? But I don't know if they're trying to make a connection here or not. Your guess is as good as mine, because that's all we can do. Like, this movie leaves so little to discuss about itself, despite trying to be all philosophical and stuff like that. All we're really left to do is theorize how this happened, and what could possibly have been the outline idea to even build this story on, if you can even call it that. Um, but, yeah. It's... Yeah, there are worse movies like this. Like, there are... But I mean, it's this is like, <laughs> I I don't I don't know what this is. It's so. I almost kind of feel like there was something in there. Uh, but I can't even tell you what it was, or like I said, where somebody could find the want to even put this to a screen, but and hire these people to put it together. But it exists. People may not remember that in a week or so, but. It is a movie that exists, so, um, that's, yeah, that's, Emilia kind of tries to add a little life to it with her character. She also kind of tries to do the over-the-top thing that Franco's not doing very well, but it just, yeah, it just doesn't come together at all. 
like there's like no cohesion here whatsoever or like I said just any ounce of what appeared to be an idea let alone an original idea so there that is our last one we're gonna come back up into the quality scale now <laughs> um, this is the tail something I had only just I feel like I heard about it a long time ago and then I didn't hear anything and then it like it aired on HBO um, and this is it's a movie that, um, there's the docu documentarian Jennifer Fox who made this movie about herself and her troubled childhood, to say the least, um, when she was kind of groomed and ultimately, uh, molested by her coach. Um, but the problem, the interesting thing about this is the way it is told in regards to how this is kind of a movie that's told in a way that we really haven't seen before, or at least very often, where it's a woman basically trying to come to terms with her memories and how her memories have kind of altered and shifted what she thinks the reality of her childhood was. And she does that in some very interesting ways, um, kind of telling her own story here with Laura Dern playing her. Um, and it's, it's told in such a way that's so unique that... I imagine some people might have a hard time grasping it immediately because um, they do they set it up in like the first 15 or 20 minutes in a really big way and if you if you if you like don't want to know anything going in then you probably don't want to hear this even though it's in the first 15 to 20 minutes but just the really interesting kind of gut punch way they show this off and show how her memory is kind of deceived um, deceived her in regards to what those events really were is She's played by a younger actress who's probably in, like, her mid-teens. Um, and we see kind of some flashbacks about how she first met uh, the Jason Ritter character, the one that'll molest her, and um, Elizabeth Debicki, who is kind of runs the grounds that she's staying on and, like, keeps her horse and everything. And the way it depicts these things in two different ways to show her memories and the reality. Because we first see them, she's like in her mid-teens and all that, and there's them and her... We see the depiction of her parents and all that other stuff as she gets here. But then there's a cutoff, and we realize that she was a lot younger than she thought. Like how she perceived herself as older than she actually was. And when it cuts back for the entire rest of the movie, she's played by a younger actress than the one before. Uh, just to show how different her memory was from the reality of it. And when he, she meets later on meets um, Elizabeth Debicki older, because Elizabeth, Elizabeth Debicki is like 6'3", um, and obviously like beautiful and tall and all that. Um, and then when she meets her character again later in life, it's Frances Conroy, who is... And it, she's smaller, kind of more frail looking, and it's just all these different things they kind of throw in, these really interesting techniques, whether it be the casting or the way things are shot or anything like that, um, to show those differences. And it's just, it feels really unique and really interesting and really, and really adds a realism, especially when we know this is coming straight from the source. This is Jennifer Fox making this movie about her memories and how she remembers versus how it appears to be what actually happened and the way it actually looked. But the interesting thing about that is the events hardly change. It's all in the way they're depicted. Like, the... It, it, yeah, it's very, very uncomfortable, but but artistically just... just beautifully tells, like, beautifully in the sense of... says everything in the way that she is intending. Because... Obviously, in her 13-year-old mind, it's the, the the depiction of her and Jason Ritter's relationship. How she saw it as a romantic thing. He had her convinced it was a romantic thing. So when these scenes play out, when Jason Ritter is seducing this 13-year-old girl, it's not played to be sinister, and it's not played to be dirty and sleazy. They're played like they're romantic scenes, because that's how her mind saw it. And it's really, and what they show, too, is, like, this movie is not holding back. This is a very, very, like, intimate memoir, for an, un an unfortunate lack of be a better word. Um, and, and I was, and it's so, like, 
the way it's shot is so convincing that you are like the biggest relief of the movie. One of the biggest reliefs of the movie is the the very first disclaimer as soon as the movie ends is the sex scenes were shot skillfully with an adult body double. But it looks like it's very convincingly shot to make it look like we're seeing everything um, with their physical relationship. And it's... And, go, and going on that, um, Jason Ritter's performance, too, he is, like, like I, every time I bring up his name, I'm just, like, heaping praise on him. And here, it's, like, it's a challenging thing to do because of the part that he's playing, but it's, like, he's so, he's so in this role. Like, it's hard to imagine, like, the discomfort it would be playing a part like this. Um, but you never get a sense of an actor's discomfort when you watch this performance. This is a dude that's so kind of like constantly smiling even when he's doing the most vile things and it has to be like convincingly charming and all that and like I said play like he's the love and like the romantic interest of this 13 year old girl um, and just how weirdly convincing it is. Some people might look at this cynically and say like oh Jason Ritter must have skeletons in his closet or something. No he's just I, he really just is that good of an actor. Um, he's shown that time and time again that he is su such a skilled actor. And this, I can't imagine a more challenging role he'll ever have <laughs> um, than this. And it's just like flawless the way this is. Like I said, it's all, it's really hard to say just how well done the movie is because of this, you know, sickening subject matter. But when you realize the way it's supposed to be depicted, that's exactly what she has accomplished in the way that she shows it. And like I said, and coming from, and we're talking about actors here, talking about her, you know, telling this story of hers and putting it out there on a screen and showing it exactly as she remembers it, that really takes something. I've also heard um, some things about how she, she's been going to screenings and doing, like, Q&As, and she's just really powers through it, and it's... It's it's mind-boggling that somebody could do this and such an accomplishment in a really big way. To, but but to put this out there and show what exactly it is, like abuse victims, how they see it and how it gets to that point. Because um, it's like usually you hear stories and a lot of people have a lot of questions like, well, how could it have possibly gotten to this point? Or couldn't this have happened or that or whatever? Or somebody think this or whatever. But the way it's depicted like this shows you exactly how something like this could get to that point. Um, and it's like, if, if you can stomach looking at it the whole time, you will see exactly how this works in this really, just, yeah, this way that just lays it right out there. Um, like I said, obviously not the easiest movie to watch, but if it's very much, yeah, it's very admirable the way it's able to tell this stuff, so, and it's like, and the really tragic thing, like one of the really, really tragic things is how also how convincing and innocent the young actress is playing her. And it's like because of the way these scenes are played, obviously she's going to seem happy. But the thing is, is it's it's been established so well and so clearly that we can watch these scenes that look like they're romantic scenes and we see this girl happy, like she's smiling. But the thing is, is it's like the happier she is and the bigger she's smiling, the sadder the movie is because we know that's how far gone she is and how much he's gotten into her head and convinced her that this is a romantic thing and they are, you know, romantic lovers and all that and it's a good thing, but it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really, um, but like I said, it's just everything ought, ought to be commended just... Yeah, it just kind of leaves you speechless after a while once you really just kind of establish all that. Um, and there's and they also add some details about how she's able to, like, as an adult, as Laura Dern, she's, like, able to... It's like there's scenes where she's, like, communicating with her memories, like, where she's off camera or she's there every now and then, like, in the background, basically talking to, you know, Elizabeth Debicki or the 13-year-old version of herself. Um, and it's just, like I said, it's just such a unique vision in regards to how this story's told and how she really puts us right inside her head in all these aspects, whether it be the adult her or the young her. Um, and there's even those moments when it's like you can see just how much the damage has been done, even in her 
far into her adulthood. Because it's like, one minute, you know, she's the rational adult, the one that made this movie, um, and she just goes about her life, but then the next minute, um, she'll be on the phone and they'll be talking about if there were other victims, and it's like, because there's still that part of her brain in there that is forever damaged by what he did, it's like, she says, oh, that, na that naivete comes out and she's like, no, there couldn't have been others that he molested because I would have known about that. But then it's like, that's something that she's like thought since a 13 year old that never quite found that grasp. And then obviously, because this movie has been made, we know eventually we're going to get to that point in the movie where she does start to grasp exactly how far the damage goes back and how much of it kind of needs... I don't know if fixing is the right word, but the, there's realizations that she still needs to reach to fully grasp what happened to her. Um, and yeah, there is like hardly a more powerful movie that, and powerful way to show this material and how that works. And it's, yeah, this is like, almost seems like it should be like, um, what's the word, mandatory, mandatory viewing, uh, to really understand this kind of stuff, and it's like, yeah, it's, it's very, it, it's emotionally draining, for sure, <laughs> um, but you'll really feel like you have much more of a heavy understanding of the material than you probably would have going into it, um, I mean, I guess, unless, of course, you've been there, God forbid, but, uh, yeah, if you... Yeah, so that's that's basically what that is. And obviously that goes without saying that uh, how great Laura Dura is able to pull this off, especially in those big scenes of realization and all that, but also balancing that with the kind of still trying to work things out and kind of her mind still haven't kind of fully developed to that stage to say, oh, wait, some of that stuff was... Some of the stuff that I've been kind of... Just kind of been stuck in my head as normal for a while. Oh, yeah, that was fucked up, too. Uh, or, or memories that just kind of surface that were gone. Um, so, yeah, that's really, yeah, that's, I don't know what else to really say about that except just describe it as such, but, uh, it's, it manages to pull all that stuff off, so, yeah. And this, is, uh, it also kind of, I don't know if it's a bummer that it's, I guess, technically a TV movie, um, because there's kind of a bit of a stigma with that. Maybe not so much as there used to be, but um, this is a movie that should be seen by many people, so hopefully that happens and it gets the attention that it really well deserves. So, and once again, you, I just, you can't really commend Jennifer Vox enough for putting this out there, but there it is. We also get one of the uh, last performances of John Hurd towards the end, so there's that too, so... Yeah, that was, so this went in a whole bunch of different directions, but that's what we have for this week. Next week, I'm going to try to see all three new releases, because I have a, just a little tiny bit of interest, at least, in all of them, um, where we have Hereditary, Ocean's 8, and Hotel Artemis. So I will try to get to all those, and then we'll have that, and then whatever else happens to be out there, and the verses as well, So, which should be fun. So... Um, yeah, so until all that stuff, 